Hello, and welcome to... <sighs> well... This was a very interesting one. This is... The Royal Navy retained its fleet units of the Royal Naval Air Service in 1918. How does this affect things going forward? And it's Friday the 14th today. And it was a very interesting live, so I recommend you go watch it, and there was lots of interesting discussions. But, I will also add, I have adapted this video in response to some of those lives points, because I wanted to explain why I was saying what I was saying. It is the 14th. I've got beautiful sunlight coming in, which is why I look like this lovely ghost-like Alex. And I'm wearing my Historian by Day t-shirt. So, what is the purpose of this video? Well, it's an interesting one. It really is. When I first saw it come across in front of me, I thought, well, hang on, that's like ones I've done before, haven't I? And I have, but I haven't done one which is a pure, they just retain it. It's always been, they retaining it, and the retaining is the reason why you're justifying keeping strike carriers, i.e. the animal class. And things like that. And I'll discuss the animal class a bit in it. But if you want to see more about them and their potential as carriers, there is a, a video link down below, which is Admirals, Lexingtons, and I think Tossers. It's an enjoyable watch. So, what did I change when putting this together? Well, I added in a little bit of more maths, and you'll see it because it's got a very special aircraft behind that maths. And pretty much the idea goes what changes. The Royal Navy retains fleet units of the Royal Naval Air Service in 1918. How would that have changed our in carrier operations in World War II? It changes the entire war, but it also changes the entire interwar. It changes a lot of the discussions. And it changes a lot of the pace of technology because you have to remember it takes a while for the RAF to get themselves off the ground. It really does. Um, this is no reflection on the RAF today. It's not even a bad thing on the RAF then. It takes a while for them to organize into a new service and new air ministry, etc. And setting them all up. And there were... There are some understandable reasons. You have to understand the reasons behind it was the idea that air power could never thrive if it was in a part of another service because the air was one and the air needed to be one. And you've got people like Gilio Duhay going around giving their various air power theories and <sighs> Duhay is a particularly interesting one. Um, I think I've covered it before but Summed up his theory is that the future of air wars are going to be bombers carrying a hundred tons of bombs, dropping a hundred tons of biological warfare and chemical warfare bombs on enemy cities and wiping them out. The thing is, you can't say he's wrong because whilst not biological or chemical, we would have done nuclear, um, but it hasn't become the whole point of warfare. Warfare hasn't become all about that, because that is such a devastating thing, rather than stopping wars, it's just put a bit of a ceiling on what weapons you use and how far you push people. It's kind of interesting. The idea was always, and in the 19th century and the 20th century, the beginning of it, the idea that the more powerful weapons you had, you were going to stop a war. What we've learnt developing truly world-ending weaponry is that rather than stop wars, it's changed them in some ways. And it's also made it less... How do I put this politely? less black and white because now powers will go all to all sorts of lengths to claim they're not involved in a war with someone else 
when anyone else looking at going, yeah, you might not actually be fighting, but you guys are doing everything but. And even sometimes, the... <clears throat> One of often sometimes termed in the press little green men, but for the rest of the world will probably be called special forces and elite troops who are or trainers. You know that's what they're there for. They're there for trainers or observers. Will actually end up in combat with each other. Sometimes, but the point is, you are looking back into the at the beginning of the twentieth century, and you're seeing all this air power theory come about. And the air power theory is not necessarily bad, but it also, to an extent, misunderstands the future and nature of conflict. Because the idea of the air being one, and the air being one whole thing, is great. But as I think I pointed out in the live, it's only really possible once you've got a space-based car and you're launching aircraft from above. Because otherwise, they need to land somewhere to refuel or rearm. And you know, these days, of course, we have air-to-air -air refueling. Great. Still need to land to rearm. And to be maintained. And where they land is going to have a big effect on them. Because you can say, well, yes, we can fly this all the way from home. It's going to be a 12 hour flight to get there. And I'll get back. It's great range of the aircraft. Good. Um, you need to provide CAP, Combat Air Patrol, over this task group in the middle of the South Atlantic. Oh, we can do it. What happens if the enemy attack when you get there and you loose off all your missiles and cannon attack? Well, the next cat aircraft are scheduled to turn up in four hours' time. Okay, so you mean there's de facto not going to be a cap over that group for four hours now? Well, they, that's when they're cycled, because it takes them 12 hours to fly out there and 12 hours to fly back. Okay. You see the problem? This is where you get into trouble. Once you do need a combat air patrol over a, a group, once you need on-call scouting and reconnaissance for a naval task force, you have a problem. Once you need combat air support for troops on the ground, you have a problem if you are tasking from a long way away. So your options are, can we build an air base closer? If not, we need to put them on a carrier. And then you get into the scenario of how many of your pilots, if you're treating the air as one, do you, you therefore, theoretically, and this was also one of the interesting things you have in this discussion at the beginning, is the Royal Navy, some of the Royal Navy, some of like BT, etc., seriously do believe that the Royal Air Force is going to train all its air pilots to operate from carriers and naval, and naval ships, and it is going to have all its aircraft be viable to operate from carriers and naval ships. So basically, they just thought they were getting an RNAS, which they didn't have to pay for. It didn't work out like that. Fair number of them didn't believe that, and a fair number of them go going, this isn't going to work from the beginning and the get-go. But... Some of them honestly believed they had the political power they could rewrite it if they needed to, and it didn't work out like that. Ah, oh, the joy of hubris and ego. Anyway, shameless book plug. Going on here. Shameless book up. Second edition coming out soon. Please. I'd... I'd this is going to sound strange, but I have a couple of I think, items I'd really like to be buying soon. One of them. New car. Not new to me car, it'll be a used car, of course. That's why I'm not buying a brand new car. Oh, good lord. My genetics, I'd drive that off the I'd drive that off the four car and I have a blowing panic attack. The amount of money you lose the moment it drives off the forecourt is just obscene. Anyway. So, you know, that that's not, not that's just not happening. Uh Alongside that, hmm, honestly, I think yeah, I'm going to need to book a writing retreat because, as much as I love them, and I love my dog, uh, um, I love my dogs, and I love my family, getting all my writing done by deadline is probably going to involve me being going somewhere where there is no interruptions and no people having 
issues. I love them dearly, but they're humans, and they're, oh, all humans have issues. And when you're in the same dwelling as them, you can't tell them to bog off politely. They're your family. There's, there's no polite way to do it. I'm British. The only polite way I can do is disappear for a week and go and get the writing done. So, yeah, that's what's coming up. A few other things which are going to be announced soon, but that's what's coming up. So, hence the Shames book plug. So what have we got? Well, the state of the RNS in 31st of March 1918 is dozens of squadrons. You've got 17 alone in France. You've got another nine or so in the eastern Mediterranean. And these squadrons vary between... Some seem to be operating on 21 aircraft or even 24 aircraft. Others seem to be just to have five or six, honestly. Uh, some are squadrons in name only. I mean, there is one which is technically considered a squadron, and it is operating in from four different bases and is sort of fielding somewhere in the region of 40 aircraft. It's a really interesting scenario. What I can say is World War One is like that, and you can see all the bases they have in the UK to run and support it. The thing is, the RNAS is a huge organisation which is supporting the Royal Flying Corps and the Army ashore in France. They are providing aerial reconnaissance for the fleet. They are providing anti-submarine warfare patrols. They are providing air defence for the UK. It's colossal. They are literally all around the world. They're in Durban, South Africa, Otranto, Italy, Malta, Mombasa, Kenya. They're in Imbros in Turkey, Mudros in Greece, Stravos and Fasos also in Greece. You know, they are everywhere. And they have to be. But they don't need to be if you're just going down to the fleet section. The Royal Navy has also put in place a fifth sea lord, and Sir Godfrey Marshall Payne goes on to have quite a decent career with the Royal Air Force, So, and he sort of retires as a rear admiral. He's sort of an acting rear admiral at this point as well. Uh, there's a debate often whether he's a commodore or a rear admiral. He's sort of acting rear admiral. He goes off to the uh, Air Force and gets promoted to Air Vice Marshal, but then retires as a rear admiral. So, theoretically, he should probably retire as a vice admiral, but because he's been a free star, but it's it's all confusing. But anyway, the Royal Navy has a fifth sea lord. They have a fifth sea lord for a very simple reason. They know how important aircraft are, and they know they have to have someone at the top table who understands aircraft to, in, to explain these things to them to make sure they understand it and they have the detail of it. And the first thing that happens when they have they get the fleet air arm back under full naval control is in 1938 they appoint another fifth sea lord so alexander ramsay who is married into the royal family is very very politically connected and connected and very knowledgeable on aircraft in fact if you go to my the again the as i mentioned earlier the admiral class sort of carrier video um, which was another another patron video. Uh, I talk about him and use him as a ca uh, I use him as one of the senior officers who probably be deployed with various naval forces and carriers going around the world because he has the experience and he is skilled. So the Royal Navy has a methodology of how they're using it, and they also have a methodology of what they're doing and why they're doing. Now, one of the reasons you have to always look into and find is about why does the Royal Air Force get formed in the first place. Well, one of the reasons it's formed is because there is a big misunderstanding in the Royal Flying Corps over the support the Royal Naval Air Service is getting, because the Royal Flying Corps honestly believe that the Royal Navy is doing them in the back, somehow. Because the Royal Navy seems to have, the Royal Naval Air Service always seems to have supplies, they always seem to have um, support. They always seem to have the necessary spare parts. 
and it sort of that rather than examine their own systems and find out if their own systems are wrong, they do that terribly human thing of believing their systems must be working fine because they've set up their systems. And therefore it must be that the Royal Navy is somehow diddling them and outbidding them. And it's not actually doing that. In fact, very once you start looking into it, you find out the Royal Navy is just writing better contracts to suit the scenario. Because they've modelled their procurement system and their maintenance and supply system on how they supply motor torpedo boats and small boats. Which they've already been doing for uh, two, three, two decades or so at this point. So they have a long-term experience of how to supply small, fragile craft which require engines to get and keep them going and petrol and maintainers and spare parts and all these things and the Royal Naval Air Service basically just copies and pastes the system and it works. Even more importantly the Royal Navy is used to structuring such a system to support operations around the world so they're used to it. Now under this scenario you'd have presumed that someone might have somewhere have gone, hang on, the Royal Navy have all this experience and have these systems, let's copy them. But the RFC had instead gone, we're bigger, we know what we're doing, they should copy us, and if they're not doing the same system as us, and they're getting different results, it must be because they are cheating in some way. Now, what was really fun is when you start getting into the accountancy which underpins the claims made which justify the formation of the Royal Air Force. One of these things is that there is due to be a huge surplus of engines produced in 1918. And these engines will be used for heavy bombers, which will bomb Germany into submission. No need for a massive land offensive or anything. Um, this is what happens. So that's why they must form up into one air force to, to, so they could coordinate the strategic bombing effort. effort. And again, it makes the, some, some success to coordinate, you know, bring in the strategic bombing forces of the Royal Naval Air Service and the Royal Flying Corps, combine them together and, and pull them into one group. It makes sense. There is a logic to coordinating that. Whether or not they need to be in the same service to do that is debatable, but you can understand where they're coming from. And considering the experience the, especially the RFC, are having with the Army, it is understandable. Now, again, you can find Royal Naval Air Service officers who are equally rude about the Royal Navy, but usually those are the people walking around who are saying the Royal Navy should scrap all its battleships in 1916 and just to have aircraft. And the Royal Navy is going, yeah, that doesn't really work. Okay, it doesn't. Uh, 1969, your aircraft have not reached that level. Once you've got the stop with Cuckoo, you've sort of got an argument. But there again, if we look at the viability of using torpedoes against uh, airdrop torpedoes against maneuvering vessels and the sheer number you need to be using, it sort of doesn't look quite so good. And basically, it's yeah, they are about. Mm, I'd say 50, 60 years too early in their assessments. But there's always people who want to jump onto new technology and always people who become its profits. And they see what it can be and they think it's... Uh, they see what it can be and they're so eager to reach that point they can't understand where it is now. Now, what you have going on is the sort of the RFC, the accounting system comes out and they go, there's going to be 500 or so spare... 100 or is it 500? One or the other. Um, spare engines in 1918, so we need to form this strategic bombing force. The Royal Navy attempted to refute this using their own accounting system and going, there isn't going to be. We basically have enough engines and enough engines being manufactured to include the spare part, to provide all the spare parts of the aircraft we're already planning on having. There's no aircraft surplus. Where's this aircraft surplus coming from? And the surplus coming from. And it comes from the difference in the accounting systems, and which explains the whole problem of the RFC system and the fleet and the Royal Naval Air Service. In that the RFC system doesn't seem to allocate for the engine parts which are created to provide spare parts for existing engines. Now 
I've done a little bit of study into this because of my own PhD thesis, but I have to admit I haven't gone into that in massive depth. I have friends who belong to a group of histori history or a section of history which is called Economical Statistical Historical Analysis. Uh, they are wonderful people. They are actually a lot more fun than it sounds. It's not my area of expertise. It's far too many figures jumping around pages. But you, they are the people who get together and produce books like um, B.R. Mitchell's British Historical Statistics and those sort of scenarios. If any, apologies. <coughs> any time you see a book which is sort of something like just historical statistics or something, it usually come from a historian who is of that uh, that cal um, that sort of uh, grouping, and they are wonderful, wonderful people. And they have sat there and they have broken it down to me and they say, uh, usually the phrase they use is, okay, if you want to really dumb it down, this is the scenario. One side includes spare engines in one column, spare parts for uh, engine, engine uh, components produced for spare parts in one column, and one puts it in another column. And this is why they're always short of spare parts and they always seem to have a surplus. Neither system is brilliant, but if you're going to say which one you'd, have a, you'd prefer to have, you'd want to have the surplus of spare parts, not the uh, too few. So that's life. But what have the RNAS accomplished in the meantime? Well, the naval roles of the RNS were fleet reconnaissance, I've already covered, but also patrolling coast for any ships and submarines, and attacking enemy coastal territory. Now, patrolling coasts for enemy ships, probably, and submarines patrolling coasts, not really going to be done from a ship, but, so I'm probably not going to be able to crew, include those aircraft in the transfer over, sort of fleet air arm, because that's coastal command. However, anti-submarine warfare is still very much part of the ship-based aircraft's per aircraft purpose. In fact, seaplanes from the seaplane and carriers supporting the battle cru uh, the battle cruiser force and the grand fleet regularly were used to do anti-submarine warfare uh, sweeps because submarines at that time spend more time on the surface than they do under the surface under the water so they tend to be kind of visible and you can attack them for example daily the RNAS as systematically as possible searched 4000 square miles of the channel the north sea and the vicinity of the straits of Gibraltar from um, for U-boats. They spent that in 1917 alone. Doing these daily patrols, they sighted 175 U-boats and managed to attack 107. We do not know how many they caused to dive and use up pressure as endurance. We don't know how many they caused to dive. And this is without them see actually seeing them. They see the submarine sees the plane and dives. We don't know how many of those submarines dived hit something or had some sort of malfunction on the water and never came up again. We don't know that. And we do know they have an impact. So, how can I get this all to work? Well, it comes back to the Battle of Jutland. Thankfully, there's a lot of aircraft available. Um, there's Engadine, which is part of the Battlecruiser fleet, and her short Type 184, which she actually launches and is actually being ordered by BT to launch, and BT's waiting on reports from this aircraft, which is flying overhead and is valiantly trying to make reports. Just no one's picking up because the radio's not working. And then there's Campania, which is with the Grand Fleet and probably the largest seaplane carrier we had at the time. And you notice there's a sort of launching ramp forward and various other things. Interesting vessel. And, uh, well, due to uh, radio miscommunication, she doesn't leave with the ground fleet. So Jellico don't have his air support. Now, think about that. The most powerful weapon at the time that aircraft have at their disposal is the radio. If we look at them in the you being used in the front, in the Western Front, in Gallipoli, anywhere. Where they proved most powerful was not dropping bombs themselves at the time, because the bombs they could carry were puny. 
No. Where they were useful was where they would spot for artillery and call in everything. Armageddon down on their opponents. Now, imagine the Battle of Jutland where the Royal Navy, because the, the, the Kaiserlich Marine doesn't have this support. Imagine the scenario at Jutland where the Royal Navy is getting accurate information provided by its aircraft. Not even massive information provided by aircraft, just radio information about where the enemy are. Imagine how much more efficiently Jellico could deploy. Imagine that BT might actually not make some of the mistakes he does because instead of running into the enemy and only realizing they're there when they're firing, He'll be told they're there. Sugar! He can start the turn early. It's amazing. The thing is, that information will probably change the uh, change Jutland. Will it change it into a British victory? Well, it's a as I often pointed out, it is a British strategic victory because, as long as the German, uh, as long as the raw, uh, the ground fleet stays in control, North Sea and stays the boss, it's a win. But the issue is always the loss of ships, and the fact that the British lost more and the German ones managed to actually limp home. And let's be honest, we've all seen the pictures of the sailors obviously on this channel. So, if not, go and look up the various Jutland videos on this channel. And you will see how close Sailitz comes to sinking and how close other vessels come to sinking. Well, if you have the Royal Navy deploying slightly better, getting slightly more accurate information, being positioned slightly better, slightly more warnings, slightly more... All those things improve a bit with airborne, uh, airborne uh, patrols and airborne um, viewfinding. The odds are that Germans lose from ships. So that won't take a few. It won't take that many more shells to sink Sailets. It won't take that many more hits to sink a lot of few other the German ships. And the difference the information can make would be a few more hits, a few more shells, a few more salvos. Now the thing is. What's that going to change? Well, that's going to mean that spotting and reconnaissance are going to be absolutely critical assets in the minds of the two most important admirals the Royal Navy has at this time. Jellico and Beatty. And they're the two in power when negotiating all this. And if they sit down and go, look, no. we understand you want to control of the whole Air Force and we understand your fear. But the ones attached to the fleet, the fleet air arm, the fleet component, are absolutely essential and vital to our doing our job. They are an essential core part of the fleet and fleet operations. Therefore, we wish to retain them. We also wish to retain, of course, sensibly the Sopwith Cuckoos, which are going to be carrier-based from HMS Furious, etc., and used for, carrier stri uh, used for strike, because that makes sense. So basically... Only the aircraft which operate from ships we are going to retain. Now at this point we're talking about two dozen, three dozen aircraft. We're not talking about a lot of aircraft. They might also say, look, at the end, uh, we're also there are some squadrons which we would like to keep part of the fleet and for peacetime when we expand carriers because we think we've got these other carriers in construction so what we'll do is we'll, they will put them under your administrative control for uh, the war they'll take part in your tactical operational control and they will at the end of the war transfer back uh, back to our full control for our new carriers so we retain those personnel I think the air lobby will be forced to accept it I don't see how, if the admirals, and especially if the big admirals, Jellicoe and Beatty, are both opposing it, 
and the first Sea Lord will be on there. So uh, not the first Sea Lord. Oh, well, Jellica will be the first Sea Lord, and then BT is the first Sea Lord. But the uh, the, uh, the Lord uh, of the Admiralty would be on their side. How they're going to push it any further? They're not going to. It would cause too much of a disruption, too much of an effort. And they're getting 75% of everything. And if they push too hard, they might get nothing. So getting 75%, the Navy can make a good case for what it keeps. It keeps it. And in a way, it helps them. Because the air power people want the bombers. And the Royal Naval Air Service has actually the best bombers at this time point. So, yeah, I think they would go with it. So, to support this reduced force, what do you retain? Well, I've picked Newlin in Cornwall because it's a nice airfield. Uh, Felix Stowe in Suffolk and Felix Stowe Dock in Suffolk. Because, again, though uh, Cornwall, Suffolk, etc. support the bases at Devonport, uh, uh, in Devon, uh, sort of the Portsmouth and Plymouth, you know, it supports those in the main naval arteries, as does Carldale and Orkney, that supports Scarpa Flow. Fishguard, Pembrokeshire, again, supports a naval base. And Durban, South Africa, Malta, Mombasa, Kenya, these all support areas which are f quite far away. Malta supports the Mediterranean fleet and provides them with uh, uh, land facilities for aircraft when the ships are in harbour and sort of those scenarios. And allows them to rotate and put in store, uh, store points, etc. They would also probably expand this to things like Singapore. I wouldn't be surprised if Ceylon, one the Sri Lanka, gets used as well. And I wouldn't be surprised if there's a few more bases built around the world. But not many. But enough to support the, raw, the fleet air arm in its development. Instead of using air force bases or combined bases, they'd build their own. Which would cause some duplication of effort, but probably would also lead to some combined facilities being built. I wouldn't be surprised if Malta, Malta becomes a combined, a combined air station, maybe even under a naval commander. Because the RAF just won't get the money to build on their own air station. And people look and go, why are you spending extra money? And I wouldn't be surprised if the same happens in Singapore, honestly. But, there again, that would then cause a very different scenario for the air defence of those places, because the air defence would then no longer be solely the propriety of the Air Force. So when the Air Force is withdrawing, kind of like the Royal Navy does in 19... Uh, when the Air Force was withdrawing in 1938-39, to provide, and especially in 1940, to provide the, air for, the aircraft for the Battle of Britain, and provide the air power for the Battle of Britain, you probably would find fleet air arm fighters would get left behind in those places to provide the air defence and support for them. This might then change the scenario for Malta in some other regards. It this the whole point about this discussion is it's going to have an impact a long way beyond just the fleet air arm. So we get a policy of the sea as one. This is what I've called this policy. And it's it's an interesting policy. Um, no more dual ranks for air crew, which means the Observer Corps doesn't become uh, important in the same way. It's still going to be important because the RN is still going to emphasize long-range operations and night operations. Expect dual seat aircraft to still become fairly common. Also, the Royal Navy is not going to be forming its squadrons up into... Fl the Fleet Air Arm is traditionally is formed under the RAF's ownership into flights. And everything's formed into six aircraft flights. I wouldn't be surprised if the Royal Navy goes with 12 or even 18 aircraft squadrons. The reason I say 18 aircraft squadrons is because the Royal Navy does testing early on. And they find 18 aircraft fighters, 18 aircraft of any type on the necessary number to just uh, to guarantee keeping it airborne. Uh, keeping it airborne. So if they want to have an on a deck on call fighters, they need only six. They know that. But if you want to have a constant air patrol of anti summoning warfare aircraft up to cover enough areas, you need 18. If you want to have a constant air patrol of fighters, you need 18. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Royal Navy goes, right, 18 is our number, so 18 is the number of aircraft in a squadron. And then everything becomes about maintenance and maintaining that 18 aircraft. 
Integrated fitters and squadron personnel in the wider navy. This will cause a differential in the structure of the aircraft carrier's crew. One of the interesting factors for the Royal Navy in the 1920s and 30s was dealing with the fact that a lot of the squadron personnel were, of course, not naval. They were air force, and they weren't trained for damage control. There was various points of times whether they should be trained for damage control or shouldn't, and the air ministry was always very anti them doing it. And the air ministry was often... The Air Ministry saw any training like that as making them very navalized and could possibly dilute their own culture. You have to remember the Air Ministry in the 1920s and 30s is in some ways a very good organization, in other ways a very paranoid organization, and in many ways often a bit of a confused organization. And I'm not saying the Admiralty is any better. The Admiralty has its own issues. So the Admiralty has its own 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 collection of issues. Uh, basically, what I'm saying is they're a group of humans. So, ego not perfect. If the sea is one, though, the iron will need to invest into that. The impact will also impact the Royal Marines, the Mobile Naval Basing Force, and the wider naval strategy. It's an interesting thing. Once you start looking at Mobile Naval Basing Force, and you've got fleet air arm as part of the Royal Navy, well, might you include, you're going to sort of adapt that to include possible ba a, a support structures to support the air arm as part of your mobile naval basing. You might add in extra air defense. I wouldn't be surprised if the Royal Marines found themselves with a little bit of an expansion. There was already a sort of scenario where you pretty much had a brigade of Royal Marines for each of the Monabs uh, by about 1938-39. And I wouldn't be surprised if you also found yourself with the Royal Navy adding in an air group. Somehow. Officially they shouldn't, but there again they might look at the Royal Air Force and think, We love you, but you are very Eurocentric. And we have to think about theatres in the Far East. So, yeah, we will figure out a way to do this. Which could also adjust some later ideas I give in terms of numbers of aircraft, because, you know, if you've got them for mobile naval basing course again, that's going to increase that. It's also going to make it a more blatant political battle between the Royal Navy, uh, Royal Air Force Emissary and Royal Naval Service Amity over aircraft procurement, with the former trying to control as much as possible, mainly because they'd be worried they're going to be getting shorter at the short end of the straw. Again, you will see uh, the Air Ministry... One of the things I find strange is I look at where the Royal Naval Officers go, and it's almost as obsessed, the RFC are obsessed officers who are obsessed with proving that it wasn't their fault that aircraft procurement for the RFC ran into issues. So they almost do a death dive to keep RNAS personnel out of it. And this is one of the troubles that they have to then learn how to be a procurement, how to be an air ministry, how to be a procurement organisation. And it takes them, I would argue, a good 15, 20 years to get to there. And while they're learning, as they start in the historical phase, the Admiralty is theoretically supposed to be is having to communicate between them to industry to get the information on what aircraft it can build. And it's you can imagine the fun that causes. Well, now imagine a system where the Royal Navy has capitalised on its knowledge and in, its knowledge and already. Uh, Hannibal's relationships with those same companies is running its own procurement of aircraft. It has its own personnel, its own engineers advising it. The Royal Navy is going to be procuring a small number, but they're going to look different than the R R RAF procurement. It's going to look different, and it's going to cause upset and disputes. You can see that happening. So you can now even starts to happen in World War Two. It's one of the things, the problems. So the Royal Navy's got a fighter all planned to build, and the RAF goes, "No, we need all the Spitfires we can get for the Battle of Britain. You can't have Supermarine build Spitfires or anything for you." And the Royal Navy's going, "But we need fighters for fighting." And the gum goes, "Oh no, Battle of Britain!" And you can understand everyone involved, but it just—it's a bit sort of case of, "Okay, take a step back." Yeah, this is not productive. Fine, if you don't can't have them, they, if the Navy can't have them, you then have to let the Navy go and get something else. And there's almost a war when they find out the Navy's actually just gone and bought, uh, buying aircraft from America. Because the Navy's going, you're shutting off all our agreements with UK but, uh, UK companies, fine, we'll go buy them from the Yanks. And that, oh, you're spending money outside of our procurement system. 
Well, yes, because you won't let us procure anything in your procurement system apart from the Fulmar, which is lovely, but is not exactly going to be in world class in 1942. It's... And that's during the middle of... Uh, during a world war. When it's painfully obvious you need the aircraft and you need the fighter defence for fleet operations. So, you can imagine the joy it'll be. But I can see, honestly, the reality of in peacetime, the Royal Navy will be procuring things for their motor torpedo boats, will be procuring things for their wider ships, etc. And as we do know... In fact, what was... What can I say about that one? As we do know... Sorry, magpie. Um, as we do know, sort of things like the uh, the site, the, the the dive bombing site for the skewer, which is developed by Vickers. It's a beautiful thing, which the Air Ministry never ordered or paid for development of. And whilst it wouldn't be completely unheard of for Vickers to go and develop something completely off their own back, a dive bombing site for a naval aircraft that perfectly fits the proportion of the uh, proportions of the Blackburn skewer. Well, hmm, yeah, and of course the Vickers do not take a huge amount of money from the Royal Navy in terms of procuring 14-inch guns, sights, uh, sighting systems, all sorts of stuff being developed and technology by them. So the point is the Royal Navy is used to handling big projects and is used to wheedling things in. So I would not see the Royal Navy not get, not getting the aircraft it wants with its controlled procurement. I could see there being a sort of de facto split where some companies, the Air Ministry, basically blackballs and goes, we won't procure from them. And the Navy going, fine, we're procuring from them. I could also see that system breaking down very quickly. Because those big companies are the big defence companies and... <laughs> They own the politicians. Well, no, nice way. They don't own the politicians. That's going on too much. Uh, they're going to be at the same parties, at the same dinners as the politicians. They're going to be ones donating to their political campaigns. And they're going to be whispering in ears going, You realise the Air Ministry's blackballed us because we, we supply aircraft to the Navy? And you can just imagine the politician's face going, My dear Jerry! The check didn't bounce, by the way. Yes, yes, yes. That's terrible, terrible. Can't understand what those shameless technocrats, bureaucrats, you, whatever you want to add in phraseology, are doing over in the air ministry. Of course, when we're in power, we're, we'll see it sorted out. So I don't see it lasting long. Um, that's the one benefit of a democratic system. If you've met, if one set of politicians have been managed to be um, snoodled, uh, the next part, set of politicians will be long, not too long, uh, not too far down the road. <sighs> Happy days. So, then we sort of look at the Washington Naval Treaty and some other factors, you know. Washington Naval Treaty comes on. 135,000 tons of carriers based on five 27,000 ton carriers. Basically, fleet carriers. When you're talking about a, a carrier of up to 27,000 tons, you're talking about a fleet carrier. That's not a scouting reconnaissance flat carrier. That's a fleet carrier. That's a do-every-job-under-the-sun carrier. Uh, no limitations on carriers under 10,000 tons, but... Trying to build one on the 10,000 tons that's practical on naval lines is frigging difficult. You can build one that's a CVE in World War II, but then you're building basically something which is, well, as I would describe it to something like Hermes, Hermes is the sloop to that carrier's flower class corvette. I... This is the naval version of what it would be. The other thing is the emergency merchant hull build version of this. We can build that, but we're only going to build that in wartime when we absolutely need to because it's so many compromises on various things like survivability and all the other sort of stuff we build into these ships. Uh, we, pref uh, we, we don't want to spend our money on that in peacetime. We don't. This is going to survive far better. Theoretically. Allowed to build two carriers overweight as long as they are conversions. Hmm. And of course is HMS Furious. 
Up there, after she's been turned into... Lord only knows. I, 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 this is one of the main problems you have with air. If you have more aircraft construction, aircraft carrier construction going on in this period, there are some really random ideas of aircraft carriers. But the saving grace is if they're all smaller carriers, it'd be interesting. So the Washington Treaty is probably still going to happen. I'm not going to change history and go now because the Royal Navy has control of aviation. Britain is not going to take part in the Washington Naval Treaty. That doesn't work. That There is no logical foundation for moving in that direction. And the whole point of doing alternate history is to discuss the real history and work out why, hap why that happened the way it did by looking at what would happen if things were different. It helps you sort of start to look at various factors. And then we have the Admiral class, which are a favourite of this channel because, as I've said before, I have very strong suspicions about the Admiral class, uh, Admiral class battle cruiser at Camel Lairds. I have strong suspicions based on some of the notations found in the Ark Royal files at the National Archives and various other places. Where and Camel at the and also in the Camel Lairds archives up at uh, the, in the Wirral Archive Centre. This uh, so not, I have a strong suspicion, although I have never found the smoking gun to prove it. But I have the strong suspicion that they were at least asked to make a study. Because when the Ark Royal is being built, one of the justifications given for the selection of Camel Lairds is they are Britain's large carrier specialists. Strike carrier specialists. And they have never yet officially built a carrier. So... How can they be specialists in something which they haven't yet built? And Okay, if this was a public document going out to politicians, I can understand the flannel, but it's an internal document going between naval officers. In other words, they don't, they're not going to be lying to each other. There's no benefit in them lying to each other. They both know where everything is going on. They're both senior officers in the, in the Admiralty. So that means there's something they know that I don't, that... I haven't found the records for. Maybe they just not survived, not been, they've been pruned or whatever. But the only large ship which could be converted to a carrier, which would fit the timeline, would be an Admiral class battle cruiser. That's the only vessel there that does that, that fits the timeline. Unless the, they ordered a Phantom aircraft carrier and never built it, and I can't find any records of that either, and that's even less likely that they were ordering a brand new aircraft carrier to be built and then cancelled it. You know, that would, that, uh, doing that, going to that level you're doing that, there's going to be a lot of records for that. Whereas converting something which has already started and it's been paused anyway hasn't been broken up yet. Hmm. But I don't think they get saved under this scenario. I'm sorry I don't. My, under this scenario, well, the RN will be pushing for more naval aviation support, especially in reconnaissance and scouting. I.e. cruiser support, which means it's going to be pushing its scouting cruiser carriers. I.e. Hermes. The 11,000 tons. Rather cute looking vessel here. Now... In this scenario, I think it's still courageous and glorious, which get converted rather than the admirals. However, I think there are different limitations. I think the Royal Navy pushes through and goes, right then, we want 12,000 tons because another 1,000 tons that fits with the scenarios, the Hawkins and other things. You look at the limitations put in on these ships, they, they usually go for a little bit over. They want 12,000 ton vessels, up to 12,000 tons vessels, and they're allowed scout carriers. Up to 120,000 tons, that's up to 10, 12,000 ton vessels. You could build smaller vessels if you want. You can try and build them for 8,000, 9,000 tons and watch them fall over, but, you know, in the nicest way, if you try and build them like Rio Rio, etc. Uh, but it, the, 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 you're allowed up to 12,000 tons. And fleet carriers, again, it's five. But I've changed this one. Because, okay, the 27,000 tons carrier limit was built within, it was, uh, was written within relation to the 10,000 ton limit. And the debating goes along. Duh, 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 duh. You can imagine, uh, I won't get into the full debate, but basically it's built in relation to it. And it's two and three quarters times it. 
Well, I first of all thought, well, if I'm now like making the limit 12,000 tons to accommodate lovely Hermes, um, I think in an under. Two and three quarters times 12,000. Uh, that's that's 33,000 tons. That means I'm going to have to start ordering capital ship tonnage and all sorts of things, and I don't think they go that far. But I thought upping it to 30,000 tons is not that difficult, or not that uh, impossible, and that's still two and a half times 12,000 tons. So I think that's what they go with. And that's go that offers a vessel which is uh, capable enough in comparison to scout carrier to make it worthwhile building fleet carriers as well as scout carriers. So then the limitations for the IGN, which is an important one, and for some reason, excuse me, let me check something. That's better. Sorry, for some reason, I'd rearranged the text after last night's um, video, and it had lost the underlining for France and Italy, and I hadn't noticed till I now, and that was bugging me. So the limitations for the IGN, three 30,000 ton vessels and six 12,000 ton vessels, and the limitations for France and Italy. Now, originally, they are given 60,000 tons as their limitation for carriers, which to build two 27,000 ton carriers is not really that helpful. Um, and theoretically, under the same scenario, they should have got 48,000 tons for the scout carriers. I decided to, instead of trying to give them bonus tonnage over the, 30, over the two, two for 30,000 tons on the fleet carriers, to give them the extra tonnage in the scout carrier so they can now get five each. And this is where I start off with today's question, because the question for today is going to be, I'm going to be talking about what the Royal Navy do. And I have very carefully, I'm not touching on what I think the American and Japanese, etc., and French and Italian reaction to this is. But I would love your ideas on what you think the Japanese, the French and the Italians would get up to. I am fairly certain that Bern still comes into existence. I think with the Japanese, I think it'd be interesting. I think they would go for six 14,000 ton vessels and claim their 12,000 tons. Or maybe even 15,000 ton vessels and claim their 12,000 tons. So you could look through their carriers and go, what's roughly 15,000 tons? And go, ooh, they could build that. And yeah, they, they, they could have fun with the free 30,000 30, tons. And what they could do with that 90,000 tons. But, the historical Royal Navy carriers, how does this all work out? Well, the Scout carriers, the Royal Navy has Hermes, fits in that category. In terms of fleet carriers, Argus doesn't fit in that category. I'd have had to raise it to 15,000 tons to include Argus as well. I did look at that and consider it, but then I thought, hang on, if I'm doing that 15,000 tons, at a certain point I then have to, I have to raise the... Uh, I have to raise the fleet carrier tonnage, and then I have to raise the capital ship tonnage, and then no one's going to get that through. But the fact is, Hermes is a new build ship. It can take 20 aircraft. The Royal Navy would prefer 24. I do know any of the Royal Navy in there in comments say they'd prefer 20, an air group of 24. So I know what they, they would probably work that out and could probably, on 12,000 tons, figure they could get a 24 aircraft version of Hermes that would suit their needs, and they would get it better. Now, the other interesting point to remember is Article 8, because the replacement aircraft carriers shall be affected but only as prescribed in Chapter 2, Part 3. Provided, however, that all aircraft carriers under existence or building on November 12, 1921 shall be considered experimental and may be replaced within the time limit of the limit prescribed in Article 8 as 7 without regard to its age. So, for the Royal Navy, the idea of the Royal Navy suddenly going, we're going to get rid of these ships and build all new ones, immediately is not going to happen, because... It's an advantage for the Royal Navy to be able to pick and choose when it replaces and when it, buys, it builds new ships. As long as those ships are still useful and viable for what they need to do, they're going to keep them. Because they don't have to wait for those ships to get old to replace them. They can replace them when they want. And if they build new ships, then they have to replace them. So I don't think fleet carriers are going to change in massive composition. But we've only got one scout carrier. So... What is the differential? Now, I'm going to expand this up a bit, and if it doesn't look too regible, yeah, I'm going to change its colouring just a little bit to make it a little bit easier. 
So one scout carrier becomes ten, and the six fleet carriers, well, ultimately, they become larger with two 72 to 81 air groups by roughly 1939. That's my analysis, and I'll be getting into that where that ha as we go forward. But I wanted to explain this overall now. I did consider putting this in a, a couple of slides later, but I wanted to put it now because of some discussions I had. Some discussions that came out in the live were people going, well, how could this happen? How can you be doing this much more? Well, let me start off with. By 1930, historically, the fleet air arm comprised roughly 194 carrier-based aircraft with another 60 or so spare training aircraft for carrier purposes. This is not including aircraft which are attached on flying off from ships and all those sorts of things. So we're talking roughly about 254 aircraft. And in this scenario, where at least six of the scout carriers would have been built prior to 1930, that adds another 144 carrier-based aircraft. Now, this is also going to add in another 60, possibly, spare aircraft, especially as you're going to have to have done more training and more uh, development to get to there. So you're talking, which gives by 1930 a total of 338 aircraft aboard carriers and 120 tra spare training aircraft. That is 458 aircraft versus the historic 254. That's a massive difference in your aircraft. That's 200 more. That's almost double the number you, ha you had originally. So that means you're going to be ordering more aircraft, which means your aircraft are going to be built. And let's say this. If historically, to build that number of aircraft at that time, I need to employ 20 engineers. Let's just use that. It's not that's not an accurate figure, but I'm just using it as illustrative. If I'm going to be requiring that many aircraft, more aircraft, I'm probably going to need to up to 30 engineers. Now let's say I go through wartime. I, I get, I'm going through expansion in approach to wartime, and I've got a force of 20. Let's be honest. They're great guys. They're great engineers. You know, they're lovely. Uh, but. You know, some of the people we've got coming in, they're young'uns. I don't want them near some of them because they're a bit... Mm, and some of them are just not that good at trainers. So, if I've got an original for a group of 20, I'm probably down to about... Mm, let's say 15, who I will actually let train people. And they're each able to train one. So I can expand to 45... And then maybe, let's say, 10 of them can take on trainees as well as... Because they're good, they've good enough gone through and we've got the original 15. So I can then expand by 25 and I can reach, you know, uh, 70. But let's go back to the 30 scenario. Okay, I've now got roughly 7 of those. So I can expand by 22. So I go, let's say, I, let's say 8. I'm just a bit iffy. So I've got 22. Okay, I'm up to 52. Right, of those, again, still five I'm not too keen on, and I've got the original eight I'm not that keen on, so, you know, that takes it down to about, let's be honest, 39, but I can now span by 39, and train up them, and I am now at 91. You notice how the figures go up dramatically more when you start from a base of more people. It does, it's not that many more to begin with. But it has a massive overall impact in terms of your acceleration of personnel and training up personnel and expanding and your facilities for expanding. Now, what is more, these aircraft we formed in squadrons. That's important from a tactical and organizational perspective. Okay, that's going to give you a lot more officers of Lieutenant Commander rank, who are usually the ones running squadrons. It's going to give you who are experienced in squadron command. It's going to give you more commanders, who are the air group commanders. It's going to give you more senior engineers, i.e. squadron level engineering posts, i.e. all those sort of things which are going to, ma are going to match up and going to become important. Now, by 1939, the carrier air groups, well, you have 10 scout carriers in service, Plus those two new larger carriers, replacing, let's say, oh, Eagle and uh, Eagle and um, Argus. 
Oh, well, actually, just Eagle will give you the two. Oh, just Argus will give you the two. And if you add in Eagle, you get three. But we'll just go on. We'll just do Argus. You've got 570 aircraft, eight aircraft with roughly 160 spare training aircraft. Now, the historical reactor is 268 with 18 reserve. The reality is that you would be therefore have 738 aircraft on this scenario versus the 348 aircraft you would have you had in reality. That's more than double the strength. This is the point. You are going to be long term. You are doubling the strength by roughly 1939. More than that. So whilst this would not have maintained an overwhelmingly massive industry or anything like that. You're still going to have recessions. You're still going to have the issues that you had historically. You are going to have a far larger industrial base to draw from because you have got double the number of aircraft than you had historically. You've also got... Well, 16 carriers in service rather than roughly 7. So you've got twice as many carriers in service. And in terms of governments, because people response and some people respond well, governments don't like spending money. They don't. However, they spend money when they have to. And one of the interesting things about the British government in the 1920s and 30s, and this is a rather interesting thing, they banked when they did the naval treaties on America not spending the amount they had, not uh, spending up to their full limitations, not not actually going to the full quota they're they're going to do. The Royal Navy was always built up to its full quota. Aircraft, everything it carries, everything it could have, it built up to the limitations of its treaty. The government was always prepared to pay for it. And if necessary, the government, the, the navy could turn the treaty on the government and go, "You are underfunding us compared to the treaty," and they would rock back quickly. Why? Well, A, you're still dealing with a country which has got the aftermath of the We Want 8 campaign in the political spectrum. You're dealing with a very different political generation than you're dealing with today, and what we see even post-World War II. The generation we see post-World War I, they don't want war. They are in shock of war. But they are also still steeped in the Edwardian-Victorian period of you invest in defence. So whilst they will not give the Royal Navy for money for a been more than they are minimally allocated under the treaty systems. And if it hadn't been to accept for the London Naval Treaty, I'm not sure if the Royal Navy would have got things like travel class destroyers, etc. The, well, if it's on the treaties that they are allowed it, they will build it. So if they're on the treaty, they're allowed those ten vessels. They will build them. If they can build them at one a year, which is what I've gone with, they're definitely going to build them. Because that would fit in the county class. Remember, they've got nine of them to build. So if you probably would start in about 1922, you'd probably be looking at, well, I said I've got about six definitely in service by 1930. You could have all nine in service by 1932. But let's be honest, let's be, let's be nice and push it up to about 1933-34. And give them a little bit over, roughly a year in between each ship coming to service. They would have kept a pace of construction going. Now, this is going to change some of the ship constructions. I mean, HMS Unicorn, why are you going to build a forward aviation support ship when you've got a dozen, when you've got ten of these things going around? Or if you do build a forward aviation support ship, you will literally build one of these, uh, build another one of these hulls but just put all the accoutrements on of an afford aviation support ship and go, this is an auxiliary, honest. They might even get away with that. So you wouldn't get uh, th uh, that sort of scenario in that. But you get these being built, and as you build more of them, you get more experience constructing. And then, of course, we have the new build fleet carriers. Well, here is the other interesting thing. The Royal Navy never wanted five carriers, they wanted six. Which is one of the reasons why they're always looking at pitching 22 to 23,000 ton vessels 
in the 135,000 ton limit. But under this scenario, you get a 150,000 ton limit, which is 25,000 tons. It would give you six of them. Now, under this scenario, you could get an Ark Royal size carrier with an illustrious style armored deck hangar because Ark Royal is 22,000 tons historically. So theoretically, that gives you an extra 3,000 tons to play with. 3,000 tons you can function into that design to get the armor in you want to get the uh, to get the dream Royal Navy carrier, which is the fusion of these two. I an implacable indefatigable class with bigger hangouts. You might even have deck edge lifts. Now I say the reason you might have deck edge lifts because if you consider they've been wanting to put 24 aircraft and maximize the smaller carriers while they've been building them, they might well have decided to actually that the North Sea, North Atlantic isn't that bad and they can go with deck edge lifts after all building the small carriers. So because of the evolution you'll have had in these vessels, you could end up having a armored hangar carrier with deck edge lifts version of HMS Ark Royal and two of them in service by 1939. That is a legitimate uh, legitimate likelihood because, again, you've got 25,000 tons to use rather than 23,000 or 22,000. And that also means you don't build HMS Unicorn to support this. You build HMS Unicorn to support this. If you are building ar the armoured versions of this, you do not need to build HMS Unicorn. Which is a shame, because I like HMS Unicorn. But, you know, I'm sure something else will be built. And I'm sure I'd really like the carry arm and carrier versions of HMS Ark Royal. With, uh, with uh, you know, deck edge lifts that can take massive aircraft when they want to. That, that would be really quite cool. It's a really cool system. Of course, though, it's going to be more than just the carriers which are affected. And the carrier design... It's kind of easy to work out because, well, if you when you look at the Royal Navy's planning and strategizing on a carrier design, the whole way through, they almost always seem to have this sort of dream carrier, which has these two combined, and then they work from that down to what are the aspects we need for the mission profile for this? Is it going to be a fleet carrier or a strike carrier? A strike carrier, we go for all the hangar space we can get, but it doesn't have the survivability we want. Fleet carrier, we go for all the the armor and solubility we can get, but it doesn't have the hangar space we want. You have 25,000 tons. Well, if you have ever had the joy of looking through some of the uh, archive plans, you'll soon realize that there's quite a lot of plans which would have fit roughly the 25,000 ton mark, which do have, how do I put it to say, definitely the size of this, and probably about 90% of the survivability of that. So they would have been an acceptable compromise that the Royal Navy would have happily had. But what comes next? Next, of course, is the wider fleet. And this is a more interesting scenario because if the Royal Navy's wider fleet is involved in this process, you have a far larger depth of personnel to understand aviation understand its abilities, understand its procurements, and they're going to be a feature in the procurement of the air defense systems. Now, the Royal Navy in 1939 is probably the best prepared of any fleet in the world for air defense. It's still terrible, but it's the best prepared of any fleet in the world. Why? Because on paper, all these guns are AA guns. Or, you know, they've got pom-poms on every single ship. They've got all these systems on there, they're, they're deploying radar more widely than any other navy. All these things, and yet you very quickly realize, well, hang on, the false positives are the exercises. And the Air Ministry's obsession with level bombing and heavy bombing has meant that we have guns which cannot elevate high enough to deal with aircraft coming and attacking the actual ship itself. Well, that would probably not be a factor because in exercises where, which carry out more routinely, involve large numbers of aircraft and take part, 
you are probably going to have different experience. You're also going to have the fact the Royal Navy, with control of its own procurement, probably the, it, well, it first expresses interest in dive bombing and produ procuring a specific dive bomber about 1926. So the odds of, by 1936, them not of designing systems to deal with dive bombers after they've probably got them in the service would be very, very low to astronomically below zero. Um, yeah. So, these guns would not be the ones which can do up to 55 degrees. No, they'd be 70 degrees, maybe even 80, 85 degrees, but at least 70 degrees. Which will make a very different scenario in terms of air defence of the wider fleet. And a lot of the criticisms which are levelled at the Royal Navy at the beginning of World War II in terms of its air defence plan would just not occur. Now, this combined with the large number of carriers for and the, probably the use of the smaller carriers to do more of the anti-submarine warfare work and maybe the large number of fighters available and large, those smaller carriers could also be used for convoy escort, etc. could well lead to a very different scenario when it comes to force survivability, especially in the early days of the war when the German force is definitely nowhere near the effort it, can, it comes to later. Let's be honest, the submarines they have in 1939, even most of 1940, is the submarine force is almost laughably small compared to what it becomes later on. So, under those circumstances and with the limitations they have at that point, the losses sustained in the 1939, 1940, even 40, uh, to early 41 period by the German fleet could be devastating, but also they're going to have a cumulative impact on the British, because the British are taking less losses from air attack and less, uh, suffering less from the scenario. Dunkirk, probably... Well, Dunkirk, you'd have better guns, but I doubt any of the carriers would get involved, etc. But the scenario is going to be far more in the British favour. You are less likely to have the problems that come about later in the war, and you also don't have to, if you've got better developed equipment at the beginning of the war, instead of you having to develop new equipment, build the new lines and implement it, you've got the stuff ready to go. This is one of the big advantages which is often forgotten about with American procurement. America is able to watch the war for a couple of years and adjust their systems in peacetime, so when it comes to wartime, instead of them designing new systems and having to implement new production lines and suddenly, and suddenly, sort of start building on it. The British, the Americans are able to have already designed the systems, implemented those new production lines, and then just spool them up and copy them. And that is an order of magnitude more easy. Uh, no, not easy, but um, simpler, more scalable. This is a factor which cannot be ignored. Now, with a better air scenario for the Royal Navy, they, you'd have to expect the British to be in a better place. But you'd also, of course, and I will say this, I was already asked the questions, but I will say, you know, you also have to expect that the Americans and Japanese and the others will be in a better place because they also have more aircraft. So we could be dealing with a very different scenario. One of the questions brought up during the live was about jet engines. And, well, if the Royal Navy has their own procurement facility and their own ability to procure stuff, and develop stuff in competition, for want of a better phrase, but uh, in addition to that which is being done by the Air Ministry, you might have a very different policy appear with in terms of the jet engine. It might be started to work on a lot earlier, especially as the jet engine has a lot of uses from the naval perspective. You get a nice gas turbine going earlier, that could have an interesting effect on the development of the Royal Navy's fleet in the, 19, in the late World War II, early 1950s. Now, I still think the torpedo spotter reconnaissance comes about, because this is, to me, the absolute dream aircraft of the scout carriers. It's also going to be an interesting thing, as usually it's the largest aircraft in the fleet. And if we think about that, if you've got roughly a Hermes equivalent with 24, roughly 12,000 tons standard, with 20, able to carry 24 of these, 24 big aircraft, that's going to be quite an interesting thing. 
Think about again, if you have 10 of those in service, where are they going to be deployed? Well, you're probably going to have a couple in the Far East. Okay. Might have a couple in the Indian Indian Ocean. Could have a couple in the South Atlantic, a couple in the Med, a couple in the North Atlantic with the home fleet. You probably have your fleet carriers divided between the home fleet and the Mediterranean fleet, as you did traditionally, well, historically. But if you've got that all set up as the standard peacetime routine, even before war begins, A, you're going to have far more infrastructure around the world to support those carriers and that aviation facilities. But also, that means you're going to have those carriers already in place for hunting down things like the Deutschland, or the Graf Spey, or any other German surface raiders. That's going to be useful at the beginning of the war. Now, why do I think the Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance appears? Well, look at that name. The prior, the, this aircraft is entirely the experience of World War I in a, in a nutshell. And if you think about the Battle of Jutland, where this came from, where this scenario has evolved from, Spotter Reconnaissance. Spotter Reconnaissance. This is it. Those small carriers are there to provide spotters for the fleet for the capital ships and the fleet units, and they provide reconnaissance for the wider cruiser force around the world to hunt down enemy surface raiders, enemy forces. The torpedo is a great thing; that's their attack methodology, but that's not their primary role. Spotter reconnaissance, and this is going to be something for the British now. One of the things I do think is you would have more powerful engines developed. I think you can't fail to have more powerful engines developed, mainly because A, the British are going to be ordering more as a whole, because of course the Navy is going to be ordered, under this scenario the Fleet Air Army is not only uh, under naval control, but it's bigger. The way the Navy structures its procurement of engines is also different than the Air Ministry does for most of its time. So. The, considering the Navy probably continue its practices of the RNAS in nineteen in World War One and carry on with using the same system as they're doing their motor torpedo boats, it's going to be a more encouraging to grow system. And additionally, with those motor torpedo boats, with the motor launchers, etc., and the other reasons the Royal Navy has for procuring very similar engines, very very similar engines as the aerial engines. Where it is, again, very important you get as maximum amount of power from the minimum amount of weight possible. That's going to allow them to leverage a lot more development work with the in industry. It'll be, it'll be something they'll be able to do. Because they'll be able to go, yeah, we see if you do well on the engines and you provide the engines we need for our aircraft. Well, you know, we've got these motor torpedo boats and these motor launches which need new engines. And the thing is, people often think, oh, they buy them and that's they've got their engine in. They don't. A, you might buy new ones. The motor launches often don't last that long. And B, you put new engines in them. And you buy new, you buy spare parts from them. And you want to sustain this all around the world. You want to set up infrastructure to get you spare parts in Singapore, in wherever you are in the world. For example, the Royal Navy maintains a huge a store, a store scenario down in the Falklands at certain points. This is going to provide a lot of procurement, but also a lot of practice of sending out infrastructure and sending out supplies to that infrastructure. So if you think about it, you have more carriers, you have more aircraft being procured, you have more bases around the world which need supply set to, you're going to have a lot more practice at distributing logistics, you're going to have a lot more logistics to go for. This is going to increase the amount of procurement going on. And as I started off by saying a little bit earlier when I was talking about the economics, the economics of the situation are the world is still going to be bad. I'm not going to pretend this is going to magically fix the world economy or anything like that. But it's going to mean the level you sink to, which instead of in, in, in historically terms is here, from up here is down to about here, I'd say, will actually mean sink to about here instead. So it's not massively higher, but it's just enough that if you are doubling down from there to there, you get to there. Whereas if you're doubling from here, you get to here. And there's a difference in that. 
And that's the thing, when you're doing the build-up later on in the 1936-37 onwards, after laying the grounds of the infrastructure from about 1933 onwards, that's when Henderson's going around putting out all the money to all the companies to start investing in building uh, facilities to manufacture and ship armour because they've all gone moribund and they've gone in the pot and how to build more engines and all those sort of things. The, when you start doing that, you're going to be starting from a big, uh, from a grander base. There's also the fact that, again, with the engines, the Royal Navy has a peculiar requirement, and you can see it especially in the skewer, but in the Fulmar and other things, where the Royal Navy really does require more power for its aircraft than the RAF. And it's an absolute necessity for the Navy. The reason is this. When you're building a single-engined aircraft for the Navy, it's also got to take all the survivability gear and all the ex beacon, all the extra systems you need for a naval aircraft to operate from carriers. It's also got to be built a lot heavier and a lot more sturdier because it's got to take part in the controlled accident that is an aircraft landing on a carrier. All these things are a factor in the development of naval aircraft, which means to get a similar power-to-weight ratio, you need a lot more power. And power to weight ratio is a big factor in this period in the performance of aircraft. It's a really big factor. So whereas the Air Force A can build their aircraft lighter, B if they need to have the space that they can make them a multi-engine aircraft, so they don't need to worry so much about that, the Navy doesn't have that same criteria. This is one of the reasons why when the Royal Navy does get control of the fleet air arm, one of the first things it does is order the Griffin and the Napier Sabre engines. The late the 2000 horsepower engines that the Royal that the British forces absolutely desperately need in 1942 onwards. They're ordered by the Royal Navy because the RAF is concentrating everything on getting as much Merlin and 1000 horsepower engine production as up as high as they can do. But that doesn't work for the fleet air arm because the Royal Navy is going, well, hang on, 1,000 horsepower doesn't help us. Uh, power to weight ratio to achieve similar combat capabilities. Oh, yeah, we need about 2,000 horsepower, so we have to order that. So I'm not saying that the Royal Navy are going to have got a 2,000 horsepower engine magically in 1939. Uh, I doubt that. But I do not consider it beyond the realm of possibility that they've got engines which are roughly 1,500, 1,600 horsepower because of the Royal Navy knowing they desperately need the horsepower and them investing and pushing for it. And again, people are going to say, well, you know, justify the money, the expense of this. It's not as much as you might think in this period, and the Navy is already getting a fairly decent amount of money. But again, I will remind you of this point, if we go back to it. The government pays up to the treaty limits. Yes, they will not do a dime over that, but they won't let us uh, let the Royal Navy drop behind. It's just not sensible for them. And that brings us to this interesting thing of the skewer dive bomber, which has possibly the most accurate dive bombing site produced in World War II for a naval dive bomber in its period of 1939 to 1942. Now, the thing is, it's a brilliant site, which appears out of nowhere in terms of British development. Uh, there's no one apparently funding it or anything, it just appears. It's amazing. But if we go back to when the Royal Navy started wanting a dive bomber in roughly 1926, this would not have been first generation dive bomber Blackburn Skewer in 1939, 1938. It would have been third, possibly fourth generation dive bomber. It would have had a more powerful engine. The differences you would have had in the performance of British dive bombers would have been obscene. Also, it wouldn't have expected to be doing the fighter duties because they would have been able to have actual fighters. And one of the things people often say is, well, it's procured as a fighter. The reason it's procured as a fighter and they start off the procurement as a fighter is because the Air Ministry it keeps not letting the Admiralty procure a dive bomber because their view is it's a waste of resources because you don't need dive bombers, you need heavy bombers. You need to do that massive bombing campaign to destroy cities. It's Gilio Duhe, it's Trenchard, it's the whole doctrine of the bomb will always get through and total annihilation of your enemy. It, that's their philosophy of warfare and that's what they believe is the case. And they are not 
again, this is one of the things, people turn this into a, oh, they're doing it because they're cynically and they, they don't like the Navy or anything like that. It's not that. It's because they passionately believe, believe they are right and that is the best course of defence for the United Kingdom. They are utter patriots. They believe that is the best way. I don't agree with them. I don't believe that's the best way and I think history has backed me up on this. But that is their belief and that is a sincere belief. And it's like the Navy as sincerely believes a strong Navy is best for British defence security. Again, I would say I more agree with that, but I again don't 100% agree with that. You need other things as well. So you have to expect it as a, respect it as a sincere belief. But that is one of the reasons why the skewer is actually procured as technically a fighter when it's not a fighter. And when you look at its performance characteristics, it definitely is a dive bomber. So, you wouldn't have had that particular problem, that particular issue. Which is good to know. And then we get on to actual fighters. Well, okay. So here is the thing. The odds are under this scenario, A, the, Brit the Royal Navy's had several generations of fighters procured for it, as it did historically, actually. It did have generations of fighters. But the trouble is the last generation of fighters it's procuring, it's procuring in 1939. It's going to Supermarine. And it's something based on the Type 224 um, Gullwing. I'm, I'm, again, it's something I cannot prove. I've got no smoking gun piece of paper which proves it. But it's the only thing which fits in the scenario. There might be another couple of companies involved. But honestly, that's the one that's built. And they're talking about Gullwing. And they've got the name Seafire being alloc uh, allocated to Supermarine. And all sorts of things are sitting there, and you're sitting there going, at the, oh, this is the navalized Spitfire, it's a gullwing Spitfire. And again, if you think about that with a 1600, power, uh, 1600 uh, ho 100 horsepower engine, that's going to be a frigging rocket. But the reason the CFAR as that one doesn't get built, and the reason the Royal Navy ends up with the Fulmar, is because they're already building this, and this sort of aircraft, and the RAF don't need them. They don't want them. They're built as a light bomber. Which is not unusual. The various fighters have been turned into... Uh, the various light bombers have been turned into navalized fighters because they need to be built more durable and they need to have a second seat for navigation because if you're going to do long-range reconnaissance and navigation, you will need a second seat. But also, they can tend to be used for dive bombing and other things and the Royal Navy is not stupid when it comes to that one. But the reason they don't get a fighter is because the Air Force is worried that Supermarine will divide their efforts between Spitfire and they are having an absolute panic attack over the air defence of the United Kingdom because they spent all their money for the last few years on bombers and suddenly they realised that A, with radar around, the bomber won't always get through and the reason the bomber won't always get through is because fighters are going to shoot it down. And oh frigate, we don't have enough fighters. So, they have that as their reality. Now, under this scenario, you would A, have got the British probably, the Royal Navy having a better performance fighter in service anyway. And probably it would be on a slightly different cycle, because if we consider it, it's usually on roughly a four to five year cycle. And the thing is, Royal Navy fighter procurement uh, doesn't really get started till about 1938 and it's about two years to develop uh, two years to develop because of the Inskip award but if we go back to 1918 and they keep it they probably keep those aircraft they haven't served for at least another two years about 1920 1921 so then we go four or five years on from there so the new, new fighter comes in and serves roughly 1925 Four or five years in service there, 1929, four or five years on from there, roughly 1933, four or five years on from there, 1937. So you're going to have something which is okay for 1939, 1940, probably in service. The trouble is going to be getting the, air, the next generation aircraft into service for 1940, 41. Um... That's going to be the absolute problem with the infrastructure and things. It's going to depend on, A, how well the infrastructure is, but also it's going to depend on how well the Navy makes the case with the government. 
And that's going to depend on how things go in terms of the wider war effort. But that means there could be already a Gullwing Supermarine. In so this would actually fit with that earlier timeline as well, because Supermarine had been working on it for a while. So you could have be dealing with a Gullwinged 1937-ish fighter. Would it have the 1600 horsepower engine? Might be about 1400 horsepower engine. But they might also have upgraded and have a new variant coming into service in 1939 with a 1600 horsepower engine. It could be quite possible that they've upped its power. In which case, it's going to be a very capable aircraft. But again, remember these things will not be produced in isolation. Don't expect the British to be getting this new technology into service and other people to not be developing their own in response. They will be. It will be going ahead and others will be doing the stuff. So, time for the war. And I've already hit it on some of the bits, but let's think about... Which is different than we traditionally understand it. I do see again uh, probably some form of escort carrier into coming into service. Probably a larger escort carrier than we traditionally perceive because I do really think the British will do the same policy as they do with creating the flag class corvettes. They literally look at their sloops, which they've used for anti summary warfare, go, This is what we need to do that job. This is the size hull we need. This is what's been built, which is the size hull that we require. Boom, fit them together, done. Uh, this is the operating characteristics. I think one of the interesting things is you would probably get CVs which were faster. And I think they'd start production of them along... I think it would be one of the crash programs along with the Hunt Class Escort Destroyers and the Flare Class Corvettes. I honestly do think that would be part of it. It would also mean that from the get-go you wouldn't have the gap in the Atlantic Gap in air cover because you would have the carriers with those fighter uh, with, uh, with those the t well the torpedo spotter reconnaissance is definitely an aircraft I wouldn't be surprised if you're talking about air groups which were roughly 18 TSRs and 6 to 12 fighters now where am I getting the extra 6 fighters from in peacetime the RN doesn't do deck parking they don't do deck parking because big waves can lose your aircraft However, fighters tend to take up less space than TSRs do. And if you've got a carrier which is designed to accommodate 24 TSRs with no deck parking and space and maintenance and all that stuff, well, you can probably get a few extra a few extra aircraft down in the de down in there if you're cutting down the fighters. So I would say probably you could get at least 9 fighters in that spacing. Especially if you're if you've been creative in the design, and I have no doubt the British would have been creative in the design. We only have to look at <clears throat> uh, the illustrious class, which had honestly gov water tanks, which weren't included, of course, in standard displacement, which magically turned into fuel tanks, which would have been included in standard displacement. We have. Uh, county class cruisers which magically have the space for four inch plate, four inch armor belts, which they just happen to have saying sitting around. You have uh, <clears throat> water as armor in the uh, Rodney and Nelson. Uh, does anyone really doubt the potential of the Royal Navy having, and the, or rather the directors of naval construction and naval constructors as a general being inventive? Because I think they possibly would have done something. So. And you have to remember, whilst I don't think the standard scout crew, uh, scout carrier would have been operating with those aircraft, uh, in, with fighters, I think the ones in the Far East, the two on the China Station, would have as standard had some fighters with them. I think they would have had some fighters as part of their air group. I think they would. It just doesn't strike me as a scenario you want to not have some fighters in if you can. So they would have done some testing and working out, and probably in peacetime again they'd probably carried six fighters, but in wartime, yeah, we can surge a few more. So that would provide plenty of cover for dealing with condors and air patrols for that, but also would provide air. Ca those fighters are extra aircraft which can go up to hunt submarines if they're on the surface and provide extra eyes looking for submarines on the surface and even attack them with the 100 pound bombs let's be honest the anti-submarine bombs are not massive fighters can carry them without any, too much effort 
and rockets, etc. And it's an extra tool in case you do run across surface raiders. Uh, I think surface raiders are the first thing which really do suffer. Because if you have more carriers wandering around, that's going to quickly, quickly shrink down the areas a surface raider can operate in. For example, if we think about the Grass Bay, well, if you've got carriers in the Indian Ocean and carriers in the South Atlantic, suddenly that's a very large area which can be uh, which can be covered, especially if you've got to pair of them and they've got their aircraft up and they've both got TSRs hunting out. And then when they find you, they're going to send a strike out which is going to try and slow you down. They're going to try and Bismarck you. Maybe they try and Yamato you, but probably Bismarck you and keep on trying to attack you until the cruisers come up to you and go, Hello, we hear you're damaged. We'd like to offer you some more torpedoes and some 6-inch gunfire. Or maybe 8-inch gunfire, because you never know, HMS Cumberland might actually get to track down the Graf Bay. It's the same for the Deutschland in the North Atlantic. So I think that changes the world for the surface raiders and surface threats. I think... Probably... The Germans still have them. Because, honestly, they're the best thing they can build in their industry. And I think, honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the British TSR is still a biplane. Because, whilst it might have a more powerful engine, they're still going to want to be, obsess uh, be obsessed with attacking fleets in harbour. Which means they're going to be obsessed with dropping their torpedoes perfectly level. So they, barely, uh, so they sort of barely flop into the water. In which case, they're going to be thinking, and uh, they're going to still want to probably have the tension wire system, which they look for the swordfish. Which is why it's the only aircraft in the world which can do the belly flopping torpedo attack run. You know, with the wooden extra fins on the uh, on the end of the torpedo and the tension wire. So with those things combined, I wouldn't be surprised if the TSR is still uh, some sort of biplane. But I wouldn't be surprised if it's a biplane with a canopy and looks mm, it's kind of like a later Mark V swordfish sort of scenario. Uh, but with a far more powerful engine, so you might actually need not need the rocket system and assist, rocket assisted takeoff that's later on developed. But there again, as I said, I, my suspicion is that the CVEs would be bigger because they'd be made to be merchant hull versions of the scout carriers, rather than the C, rather than building the bare bones you need for a bare, a, 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 you know, a carrier in a sort of wartime emergency it would have been designed in peacetime to be that scenario which means they sort of step up and fill up some of the role the light fleet carries which might mean instead of the light fleets the british have these larger escort carriers being or escort carriers which are sort of the corvettes to the scout carriers crew uh, scout carriers sloop and you might end up with fleet carriers being more built by the British, which could, of course, change all sorts of interesting history with the light, with the light fleet light fleet carriers not existing. One of the interesting things you're going to get is you probably won't get Courageous Sunk doing any submarine war founding, because why would you send a fleet carrier when you've got scout carriers to go and do that? That's what the scout carriers will be doing. And also that's going to be something that's going to be practiced a lot more before war begins, so hopefully you don't lose enough of that many carriers or more than one carrier or so doing it. Again, you have more carriers to lose, so losing one of the scout carriers is annoying, you don't want to, but if you lose one, it's better than losing a fleet carrier, and one of 16, or one of... Well, you could well have a third carrier almost nearing construction, you could have uh, probably Argus not that far off, you might have even replaced e uh, Hermes at some point, you know, you, you uh, in the sort of the late 1930s, and you could be surprisingly find yourself with actually rather 19 carriers available, because like Argus, they could magically come back into service when you need them. But honestly, no, we've retired our experimental carriers. So th there could be a lot of things going on there, and of course Argus will make a perfectly serviceable extra, uh, extra sort of scout carrier for that role, for, especially for convoy escort, as it did historically. Now, the Battle of Mediterranean becomes, again, different because you have more aircraft available in Norway, more carriers available in Norway, so that could, le and hopefully their carriers are handled better because you have more experience going around them. Um, in terms of the Battle of Mediterranean, you have Farrakh Royal, etc. You'd have more officers' experience in damage control on carriers and how to do damage control of carriers because, again, you have more carriers, so you have a wider pool of officers to recall, draw from, less damage lost by, and less likely to lose Courageous and Glorious, 
So your ergo, your carriers are less likely to get sunk by bad damage control, as is sort of the case of Ark Royal, where the person was trying their level best, but they were n not using the, f they were not doing the version of damage control and counter flooding which you're supposed to do in a carrier because of the different center of mass versus a capital ship and the person was acting on instinct and training and they were from capital ships and they were it's a different policy okay it's a different system so you end up with more but the thing is it changes a lot earlier than a loss of arc royal does historically because if you go back to taranto well if you consider the illustrious in this scenario would be a larger carrier to begin with so it's going to be a larger strike you can have more carriers available, so you probably will have a multi-carrier strike. Again, that's something the British historically practiced. They don't get a do in World War II because they don't have enough carriers to be in all the places they need to be at the same time of a carrier. But they do practice multi-carrier operations in the interwar years. In the 1920s and 1930s, they do huge exercises where they have multi-carrier operations. So, And Taranto was originally supposed to be illustrious and eagle. Well, in this scenario, you could well get a two or three carriers involved in the strike. And yes... One of them might well be a scout carrier, but the other one might be Eagle, and the other one might be an illustrious with 80 aircraft aboard. In which case, the strike on Taranto is going to be frigging massive. It's going to involve dive bombers as well as torpedo bombers, so they, you could even see the Gilio Chesre could, well, could actually be damaged. There is a possibility that the Gilio Chesre herself is actually damaged. There is that potential. That's a scary potential, but that's a possibility, because the only thing that's going to get to her is dive bombs. Uh, in terms of torpedo damage, I would expect a lot more ships to be sink sunk. A lot more ships to be sunk. Now, one of the advantages going in is the ability of the swordfish to fly low and slow, but again, I think the TSR, because of the need to develop that and wanting to go for that belly flop system and a long-range night flying, I think it will still be a biplane. So whilst it might be able to fly fast on the swordfish, I think it will still be able to go low and slow if it needs to. Which is going to be interesting. And then that's going to have ricochets throughout the war. I, I, at a certain point you get beyond which you can predict. You get to a point where the changes have been so many and so cumulative that you are now into the realms of... Uh, because it's how do the other side react to that? How do they react and then that interactions? What I will say is, I would, I'd would say the losses in Norway would not be so great. Uh, Norway would, honestly, if the Norwegian government behaves like they did originally, I they probably still fall, but it's mainly thanks to them losing it rather than the Germans winning with Norway. Denmark, they are rightly able to say we were overwhelmed. The Norwegians... The government is so busy sticking their head in the sand to try and not cause trouble. They are absolutely ignoring the fact that they just they've just invaded your next door neighbour and they have a fleet all at sea. You know, you don't want to cause trouble, but going to full alert, that's not going to cause trouble. Because it's a defensive thing if you're raising all your forces and you're taking them up. Especially if they're going to just their garrison points and forts in your own country. You don't share an actual border with Germany. Uh, not until they've taken over Denmark. Then you share a border with Germany. So, you know, Norway probably still falls and France probably still falls, but the submarines, uh, U-boats are probably going to suffer a lot more in the early months of 19, in 1939, 1940, into early 1941, the, because of the air threat and the fact that convoys can be escorted by these escort these these particular vessels, these in you know, these scout carriers, um, the Mediterranean, the Italian battle fleet is going to suffer a lot more at Taranto. I probably see them still doing the same thing they did traditionally because they did that because they believed Taranto was such a safe space, which means that they're not going to have the fleet to cover their intervention in Crete, and they're also not going to have the fleet to cover their convoys going to North Africa, which means Crete might not fall. Which makes resupply of Malta a lot easier from Alexandria, so you're not probably going to bother with doing the convoys from Gibraltar, because why run that maelstrom? And also, North African campaign is going to change, because the naval force are going to be able to support far more there, and they're going to have 
far more defense against air attack in the Mediterranean. Uh, that might actually mean you withdraw major units from the Mediterranean more, more quickly, because why risk them if you don't need them? So I think Queen Elizabeth class... I wouldn't be surprised if the Queen Elizabeth class, especially the upgraded Queen Elizabeth class, come back to the UK and are part of the force countering the Germans. I wouldn't be surprised if Rodney and Nelson find themselves in the Indian Ocean with some carriers, and they're able to go through to the Mediterranean if they needed, so they'd be kept in probably the Western Indian Ocean, rather than the Eastern, uh, to, primarily to be a deterrent to Japan, but also they can go through the Suez Canal at any point they needed to, to reinforce the Mediterranean if there's any problem change, but they're now safe space from any threat, basically. So I'll be surprised if you end up with a couple of fleet carriers, Rodney, Nelson, prob uh, probably Renown, maybe Repulse as well. Um, Hood, I think, goes in for her refit. Are sitting in the sort of the Indian Ocean. Uh, maybe some R-Class, but the R-Class are going to be perfect vessels for being in the Mediterranean. Because... You don't mind. You don't want to lose them, but losing them is less of a tr less of a sh uh, less of an issue than losing a Queen Elizabeth class. Um, the unupgraded Queen Elizabeth might also find themselves in the Indian Ocean. That could be a good place for this to stick them. So, you might find Malaya, etc., sent out there. Uh, Malaya and Barham could be in out there. Uh, Valiant, Warspike, Queen Elizabeth, I see, would be, I think, probably would be part of the force which would be looking out for uh, German surface raiders to come up. But again, they'd have far more carrier support. You wouldn't have a scenario where you'd have Victorious, etc., as the only carrier. Because, again, even if the French do surrender as they historically do, Merzel Kabir, if it happens, A, there's more carriers there, and B, you're not running vessels through the Eastern Mediterranean, you're not running convoys through the no, the Western Mediterranean, and it's the Western Indian Ocean, sorry. I was getting my East and West mixed up. Um, like you did historically, so you probably would just have a bottle-up force at Gibraltar. Again, you might, you might stick a Nelson or a Rodney in Gibraltar and just go, yeah, if you've got anything you fancy trying to get through the Straits of Gibraltar, good luck! But probably you just use submarines, because let's be honest, you could have some U-Class based in Gibraltar and some in, you know, Malta, and they, that's, that's, that's the Mediterranean dealt with in terms of that scenario, especially if you are winning the North and African campaign. And you probably would do, because again, you can interdict those convoys far more easily. And Malta doesn't have the sort of same siege scenario. There again, though, they might try an invasion of Malta under that scenario. It's... It's so many different th things change. This is the point. And depending on how those things change, it's going to have a bigger effect on what happens going after World War II itself. And it's this is the point where alternate history becomes an interesting thing. Because at a certain point, it changes from alternate history to logical progression, a, uh, logical progression, but to an extent fiction. I can give you a justifiable argument based on the history and that change and the changes up until about 1941. At that point, because there are so many actions, reactions, reactions to reactions, reactions to reactions, reactions to reactions, reactions to rea reactions to reactions to which were to reactions to which were to reactions, sort of things going on, you cannot extrapolate. It's too many butterflies. But I hope you found it interesting, and I hope you found it of use. So we've got coming up, we've got on Sunday, Brew Ships, Mahan, and the books inspired by his writings. Hmm, should be fun. And we have next week's la uh, next week's uh, year of technology stuff, gas turbines. That's very cool. And we've got steam battleships on 25th of April. That's going to be fun. May fly to present day. Naval aviation, the 2nd of May. Why did I make it so long? <laughs> oh, that's already about 100 slides. It's going to have to be altered. It's going to be altered. But, uh, yeah. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And I'm going to finish by saying thank you very much for your support. Uh, people who 
like the videos, people who subscribe to the channel, people who join the channel, people who are patrons. Thank you ever so much for your support. It really makes a difference. It really makes all this possible. And without it, I certainly wouldn't be able to do all this stuff. Without your support, I wouldn't be able to do all this history. And again, I will reiterate the question. I've done the Royal Navy in this scenario. What I think the Royal Navy would have happen. I would love to hear what you think the Japanese, the Americans, the Italians, the French would do in this scenario. I'd love to hear what you think the Germans might do in this scenario, the Russians. Because I think all of the Soviet Union, I think, could be very different in this scenario. Because if there are more carriers going around and there's an actual scout carrier designation, it becomes more a thing of, why don't we have any of these ships? Everyone else has these ships. It's what, the, it's what these nations are building, especially as... It's going to sound strange. One of the reasons why they build cruisers like they do in the 1920s and 30s is because under the treaty limitation, a treaty, those are what nations can build, so they're the state that symbols they're building. Well, if you're able to build a cruiser of up to 10,000 tons or a scout carrier of up to 12,000 tons, which becomes the big status ship. It starts off as probably it's the cruiser, but let's be honest, the carrier's 12,000 tons. It's bigger. It's new. It has these dashing aircraft flying off them. And that's going to change things. Thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoyed.